Oh my God, it's Clive. Welcome <laughs> to <laughs> Latte start. Firm and Coffee with Clive Palmer. Clive, welcome, my friend. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I see you've had a fresh haircut. Likewise, you know, we yeah. sent each other the memo. I, I can't. Uh, I've got some big meeting today at work. So I can't turn up looking a bit rough. You know what I mean? So, um, I like it, man. Yeah. Game recognized game. I like it. I like it. Well, look, thanks for joining. This is a new type of feature. Short chats with well-respected Arsenal fans, writers, podcasters, whatever you want to call it. I want to get your thoughts on whatever's topical about Arsenal. And of course, Clive Edu has been hitting the sort of news with his comments, his interview that was aired yesterday on Sky Sports. But before we look at that, I want to just talk about the window. And it's an important window for Arsenal because we need to climb the table and we've done some really good business. So without further ado, I'm going to basically share my screen as I do normally. And if those of you guys who are watching, please do drop a like on the video and subscribe if you're new. So First of all, I want to go back to a couple of quotes, Clive, if I may, that Mikel Arteta made before the start of the transfer window. And you can see them on screen, but I'm going to read them out to you, to, to you and for the sake of anybody else watching. Mikel basically said, look, now that we've cleared the deck, we have to start adding top quality pieces that are not necessarily 18, 19 or 20 years old. And we're going to do whatever it takes to get better in every department this summer. He then went on to say not only the age group, but in terms of quality in terms of leadership, in terms of goal threat, in terms of the physicality of the team. We need to improve so there are a lot of areas. Going into the window, Clive, did that give you excitement? You know, what were you hoping from for this window? Is it boom or bust for Arsenal? Tell us about that. No, I think it's just layers. Um, <clears throat> I always think back to the most painful moments, right? Painful moments drive your strategy. So there's also been a strategy at Arsenal where we tried... I think we suffered, I've used it before this term, we suffer from status anxiety. We weren't sure where we were. So that's when we got the Williams and the Louises and the Socrateses, the short-term fixers to see if we can keep us up there, see if we can nick ourselves back into that top table. It didn't work quite. Right. We were left with um, older guys, big money, poor motivations. Um, I called them squatters on the podcast, right? And... I was a bit mean, but when you're in London, and Edu, Edu basically said it, didn't he? When you're in London and you're comfortable and you don't have to win, you're not at Chelsea, you're not at City, you're not at Liverpool, where if you don't win, there's trouble. You're at Arsenal, you can, you can just pop around into Highgate, go to the coffee shops and get your catalogue out looking at your next house in Dubai and buy it based on all of our money, right? So, um, and for those who listen to me, I've been on this for a while. So when we obviously turned a page in in our strategy. Something changed, and basically it, it felt to me that um, between Edu and Arteta, they started to upward manage and really drive what we're doing. But to do that, they had to, another one of my terms was blow, this up, blow it up, and they had to get rid of people to create room, and that getting rid of people is expensive. You know, it's expensive, contract cancellations, loaning, getting people out of the room, to create room. If you look at our squad, we had a massive wage bill, but very low squad value. So the first phase of the project is, okay, let's clean up a little bit. But let's increase the squad value by buying under 20, 23 and under, high potential. We may have to overpay for some English guys, but that's the way of the West. High potential, increase the squad value, lower the wages. That's very important. Transfer fees can be amortized over four years. Wages are off your bottom line in that one year. Right. So when I saw when I saw that first phase with the six from last year, I'm thinking, yeah, this is great. This is great. But FK, I'm um, well, I'm we are both nerds, right? So seeing these sort of strategies and projects, it's not new to me. This is just smart, high performance team building, smart renewal, smart building, smart wage management. Smart cost culture. You've got to have your revenues through your wages linked in a much better way, right? So just just normal stuff, right? So I understood it. So I was quite comfortable with it. Um, some people thinking primarily about results. But you have to see beyond that because our results have always been up and down over the last half decade. This is about making this much more sustainable at the top table, uh, which, which we haven't been. So... Um, so, yeah, so I saw this phase, and then now the next layer. What's the next layer? Right, the next layer for me is now managing those darker moments, the Brighton, the Palace, the Newcastle, the Spurs, the Southampton. Oh, don't remind us. 
what what was missing? Was it talent? Was it mentality? Was it squad depth? Was it goals? Probably a subset of all of these things. But what can we control? We can control quality. We can control mentality, adding a level of experience. We can also re keep redefining and restating how we play. So I find it quite interesting that most Arsenal fans are quite excited about the signings. I ask myself a question, why is that? And I'll tell you why it is. Because we all know how we play. So when you see a signing, you can see how they fit. You know, you can see how they fit into the plan, where they're going to play, who the competition is, what their technical and physical level is. Because now we can see it. We can see it laid out, right? So uh, this is a this is a key moment in the project for me. Um, <clears throat> transparency drives unity, right? So when we all can see, we're more likely to agree. When we all agree as fans about what we're trying to do and achieve, I'll tell you what that does. That I used the word in the podcast yesterday, I used the word weaponize. It's the wrong word. What it does is it uses the one thing that's been used against us, which is division of fan base and brings unity and connection. And suddenly something that divided us, something that brought us down, something that brought discourse has now been turned and flipped into something that's absolutely massively powerful. So the power of the online fan base, the power of the global fan base, if you offer them transparency, now they become unified <clears throat> and they can be not a weight, but a driving force. Do you see what I mean? And something that can really drive the project behind. So this is my big thing. So let me give you examples of transparency. So, FK, what's happening right now? What's happening in the, in the next couple of weeks? We're getting the Amazon documentary. Bang. To the land. We're getting the Hale End. It may have already landed already, but we're getting the Hale End documentary. Full transparency. So Amazon, warts and all, one year. Hale End, what happens at the academy level when someone gets released? What's the project? What's the strategy? What's the plan? What's the culture? Bang, it's coming. These interviews, transparency in the U.S., Look at the fan engagement in the US. Look at the journalists in the, in the US. Look at the fans being able to ask people questions in the US. This is transparency. So we can all see this now. And if it starts to fit, we go, mm, this is really good. And we become engaged. Again, you all know why. If you say to me, okay, Clive, what are you talking about? I say, well, try and get a ticket for the Emirates Cup Saturday morning. <laughs> if you want to know about engagement, <clears throat> you can't get one, right? Let's do it at home. Well, know about engagement, you can't get one. So it doesn't matter what I say. You can't, I always say you can't fool people. People can smell it, they can feel it, they can see it. They want to talk about it, they want to they want to be there, they want to be in the pubs, they want to stay there longer. It it's all part of the overall project and program. That's not bad for one question, was it? I didn't, it's I didn't... not like you nailed it. I'm just sat here in, in patience. I think I tweeted to someone before saying, I hope I remember to speak when you stop because I'm just in awe of what you're saying. <laughs> I want to I want to move on, Clive, to the actual phase that we're in this summer. And if you look on screen now, these images are courtesy of Sam, who is now underscore Arsenal. There are a couple of players we've signed there. There are a couple mm -hmm. of players that are existing players that we're looking to do contracts, and we'll talk about them in just a second. And there's a couple that we've missed out on. So you can see Rafinha and Lissandro Martinez. But yeah. I suppose the, the overall question here is, how do you think this window has gone? Because obviously we were expecting William Saliba back. We signed Marquinhos, a young player, trusty we, we had from the US anyway, but he's just been announced yeah. on loan to Birmingham. But Fabio Vieira was a surprise one. We know we needed some creativity in that final third to, you know, to give us more fluid options and to really bolster our, our options. Eddie Nketiah signed his contract. Matt Turner came in as a keeper. Gabby mm -hmm. Jesus was the big one. We got him over the line finally. And of course, Sinchenko. Talk us through your feelings, you know, you, you know, is this adequate, what you think we're lacking? It's a big question, I know. No, 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 mate, it's what, what we do, it's what we all do, walking about before we go out to sleep at night, we think, oh, do we need a right wing, we need a centre mid? Come on, we're all, we're all, we're all mad, really, aren't we? Let's be honest, right? So, so what do I feel? I feel we are a forward stroke wide man light, right? That's what I feel. I, I still think within this project, we have, a number of young projects if that makes sense young players that are still developing their physicality is still developing their robustness to stay healthy like smith row is still developing and we have a heavy reliance on 20 21 year olds to score us the goals 
right? And I don't think that's sustainable. I don't think you can gamble your future consistently year on year when you don't have to, right? So, so I very obviously Jay Zeus we all love, right? Job done, tick. Um, Shinchenko, I thought very nice, makes sense again. Technical level is high. He understands the positional play of Arteta and Pep Guardiola, so systemically it's a fit. We have a we have a weakness injury wise in the left back spot. You could say if you wanted to argue, the last two seasons have been derailed by injuries in the fullback areas and destabilized us in the critical months of April and May. And if you're a manager and you're there to manage risk, you cannot allow that to occur for the third year. So you have to manage that away. And she, and Sinchenko does that for us. Um, I we all we're, again we're all sensible. I never try to insult the listeners, shall we say, and the viewers. We all would like a centre mid and another forward. Let's be honest, we'd like that, right? So, and during the cent- in the centre mid discussions, half the time we spend time trying to retire Granite Shaka in our minds because we think <laughs> we we need something else. And then next time he goes out and plays, he's man of the match. But we feel we need a centre mid, right? And we all know the people that are out there. And just on the centre mid, Clive, sorry to ruin your flow, but are you talking no, no, back no, up for are you, you talking back up for Thomas Party or are you talking left no, central I'm, midfield? I'm talking eight? I'm talking a more a, 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 an eight. I'm talking an eight. Because we have made the decision that Moel Nenny will be the backup to Thomas Party. And then the third backup to Thomas Party will probably be Sambi Lakonga on occasions to give him experience. While he's young, I think he's better one up as an eight. Sambi, I'm talking about. Yeah. And we also got Granite Shaka. And when you have, and I'll give you another thought process tactically, Thomas Part is unique the way he plays. We all know that he can't be beat. We rely on him offensively and defensively to do that role. If you look at other players in that role, like Calvin Phillips, um, Fabinho, even Rodri, we, they don't have the offensive responsibility that Party has to get us going. Right and to get out of presses, etc. They're more defensive stoppers, blockers, simplistic movers. Because of the way those teams exit, they exit around that centre-mid pivot. So we can do that. Or you can do something where you rotate somebody in deep. So you say an Odegaard comes deep, next to an Onenny, takes the ball off him in traffic. And so you can exit in different ways down the sides. So don't get over-obsessed with trying to recreate Thomas Party because it's hard to do. We haven't recreated Patrick Pierre, for God's sake. So why are we going to do Thomas Party? Do you see what I mean? We have to find other solutions to 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 and make sure to, to make sure he stays fit in the in the critical months, right? So, so for me, it's an eight, and for me, it's a scoring eight because it seems that we are we are moving forward. We've got the ability now to play more inverted fullbacks, which means we can have different skill sets. Number eight. And I think we're the scoring, shooting, passing, progressive passing player, more of a scoring threat, more of a last pass threat. That's what I think we need in centre mid. Um, do we need it now? I'm not so sure. Do I think the the wide man is a high priority? I do. Uh, I'm not even would agree with me, but I do because goals change games. Goals control your life. We are not in the Champions League. The team that stole it from us have goals. Right, and that's it's a very simple game. This right, you score a couple of early goals. Everything looks good. Coach looks good. Players look good. Fullback suddenly un- under no pressure. Everything looks good. Fans feel great. <laughs> and we, and we, we go to the pub. It's all great. We go home Saturday night, drunk too much, eat bad food, jeans don't fit. It's way. It's the way we. It's the way we live. Right. So, and so, I think we don't underestimate the value of goals. Don't think we can continue to overburden 21-year-olds to score us the goals we need. So I would like to see a another forward option. It doesn't have to be a 25-year-old, but another forward option that allows us to rotate, rest, keep people fresh. Um, and if we have that, I think we'll be in a, in a good place. I like it. Uh, obviously, William Saliba's come back. So moving away from signings that have come in, what impression has William made on you? And I suppose that kind of leads us nicely onto the contract extension talk. So Saliba, Saka, Martinelli, the three big ones that we really need to skew down. But start with Saliba first, Clive. What are you thinking about him? Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, well, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, Rolls not... Royce. Rolls Royce. The guy uh, hasn't played a Premier League game yet and he's insane for me. But I want to hear your yeah. thoughts. 
so I look at centre backs like almost like goalkeepers, right? So they give you a feeling, and you have a feeling when a centre back is there, and you have, it's that feeling is is you either comfortable or you're not, right? So, and as soon as he's on the pitch and you watch him going to a duel and you look at his recovery lines and you look at his distances and you think, mm, wow, look what he did to Werner. Werner's very quick and he suddenly made him look small, you know. I think he played against Calvert Lewin as well, didn't he? For for a, a little bit, I'm not sure if I'm if I'm mis if I'm misremembering that. Again, Calvert Lewin. I watched him in the last game at the Emirates, last game of the season. Very athletic. He's really jumping and bounding and really moving us about. We handled him, but I could see his athletic prowess. He couldn't miss it, right? When Sleeper runs next to him, he's put him on the floor. He's on his backside, and you're thinking, okay, you're dealt with. You're the most one of the most physical centre backs in the league, and it's not a problem for him. I think he's exceptional. I think he's, I, I want to use the word, and I'm scared to use it, but I will use it very quickly after his first few games. And when you see a player 21 years of age with that presence and aura around him, I don't think that happens very often. You know, he's in the French first team at 21. And that is not the dog and duck international team. Right? So, He's in that team. He's keeping Canati out of that room. And he's a very good player. You know, so he has, uh, I don't want to say it, but I'm going to say it. I think he has a almost a generational type presence on the pitch. And if you can tell me five other players that make you feel like this when you see him, I'm here. And we can all think of a couple, but let's think about this, right? Um... In my younger Arsenal life, not that young, Sol Campbell had this type of presence. And he had this type of aura, and he was a one-man defence. Um, he's not as good on the ball as this guy is. Football has changed. I recognise that. Van Dijk has this presence where he doesn't even have to. People don't even try to take him on. You know, um, so it's going to be. It's an interesting one. It's an interesting one. We haven't seen him for real yet. We haven't seen him stressed. We haven't seen him try to defend in a deep block. We've seen him in pre-season and friendly games where he can stride out and play. But the signs are really promising, really promising. I, I can't not ask you about the conundrum that Mikel Arteta will have, which is, who does he play? If all three are fit, Gabriel, Ben White, Saliba, what are you doing? Because you, you mentioned Saliba's part of the France squad. World Cup is mid-season. He's going to want to be a regular. He's going to want to make sure that he's in selection and he plays alongside Canati for, for the French national team. What are you doing? I mean, do you do you put Ben White out on the right and and go with Saliba Gabriel in the middle? I mean, what's what would you do if you're the coach? Yeah, well, the, obviously the team that played the other day looks like it's going to be the team in the first game of the season. I think we'd all agree with that, and we'd all be comfortable with that. I think in our minds, as Arsenal fans, and and as we improve, um, we need to get comfortable with first elevens and teams that end the game. All right, so stop thinking about who's going to start and think about minutes being played. Because we went to Newcastle end of last season. Uh, Gabriel was strapped up. Ben White was strapped up. I think Tommy Asu was injured. Um, Tierney was injured. Let's just avoid that, shall we? By sharing the games, making sure that people are not being judged when they're not fit to play. You know, And that's what we saw in those games. So we have an opportunity to rotate people, keep people fresh for the moments that really matter. There will be instances, injuries, booking, suspensions, all those type of things. We can cope with that better if we have better players. So as fans, we have to get comfortable having better players because and stop picking first 11s, right? Because the way the game is going now, and, and in particular the substitution rule, it's about the group. It's about the 15, 16 players and having them at the right level. And then you have three or you know, maybe five youngsters that you underpin into your cup competitions, etc. That's what we need to get to, to get to those 22 outfield players and three goalkeepers, which we've been told about. Again, transparency, I'm not being clever. They've told us what we want to do, what the squad depth is going to be. So we just need to make sure we have the versatility and the quality depth to manage those positions and manage that squad and all the competitions we want to stay in. Because last year, my my thought process was, I don't want to see the Europa League because we can't manage it. We can't get a good league season because we need to focus on that to lift ourselves back up and hopefully nick a, a top four place. Didn't quite work out. 
But can you imagine where we'd have ended up if we had the Europa League last season? We were already limping over the line as it was, right? So we have more competition that we can deal with. So we need these players to deal with the multiple competitions that I want to see us do better in. And that, of course, further reinforces the need to sign up some of our younger talent. Bukayo Saka contract Mm -hmm. conversations ongoing. William Saliba, a couple of years away. Martinelli, 2024 as well. Another contract expiry on the horizon. Um, I want to move on to uh, the departure lounge, if I may, I've, uh, as I've sort of called oh, yeah. it on late night lattes on this channel. That's one of my sayings. Yeah, you can take, <laughs> you can take that one. You can take that Thanks, one. Mate. Mate. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> uh, it's, um, it, but basically, look, Mikel's been quoted as saying, look, the squad isn't complete yet. We've still got things to do. And, and on, on your screen now, again, courtesy of now underscore Arsenal, um, we have what looks like a lounge. So Lucas Torreira, Nico Pepe, Maitland-Niles, Bellerin, Mari, Leno, who looks like he's closest to leaving. And of course, Reese Nelson. When you look yeah. at this selection of players, Clive, are there any that surprise you that they're even being talked about? Are you, would you think one or two could make, uh, you know, a, a position for themselves in the squad this coming season? Mm. So, I don't know if you watched the preseason games. Do you have you watched them? Mm, yeah, mm. I, I've watched them, and it's becoming quite apparent, um, particularly how we play, that who can play the way we want to play versus who played how we used to play. You know, so Pablo Marie now, somebody that I've tried to look at ways to see where his positives were, and when we have a deeper defence, he was absolutely fine until he met Lukaku last first game of season or second game of season last year and then you realize there's a limit to this right so um but now we play on the halfway line now you want people to compress the ball well compress the ball sorry sorry progress the ball excuse me and um and we know that he can't step through lines we know he can be caught for pace if we're high up so he doesn't fit us anymore right so Bellerin, a player we like inverted fullbacks or people are un, in the underlap but don't go past people need people to be more two-footed, be a bit more all-court. Bellerin is a straight-line runner, overlapper, stay high. He defends by attacking. Doesn't suit us anymore. Doesn't mean that he can't play. You know what I mean? He just doesn't suit us anymore, what we're trying to achieve. We don't want people running into other people's zones until they're ready to receive them. You know, so it's a traditional football, right? So of these players, I think they should all go. The one that disappoints me the most is, you know I'm going to say Ainsley, because... I think stylistically he can he can play for us, and he can play certain roles, and he can play a number of roles to a a six and a half seven out of ten level when his mind's right. But I think he wants to get his career somewhere else at twenty four, nearly twenty five. I think he's within his rights to go and get that move. But I'm not seeing many people knocking the door. Are you FK? Okay? I'm not seeing many people. Nah, <clears throat> excuse me. No, I'm not. I mean, look like you. I've, I've got a soft spot for for Ainsley. I just wish someone slapped him when he was a lot younger to say, look, you're at Arsenal Football Club and you have to wake up and realise that this is an opportunity for you to take. And his, his, you're right, his his mental state just hasn't been right. And now at this 24, 25 year of age, he deserves to have a run of games in, in, in a team. Didn't work out for him in Italy, just hasn't worked out for him at Arsenal. I feel a little bit anxious about letting Bernd Leno go. I know it's good money, 7, 8, 10 million, mm. whatever it is. It's going to help the coffers, of course, yeah. but not seen enough of Matt Turner to feel comfortable that if something untoward were to happen to Ramsdale, that, you know, he would be our number one for the season. So, um, and Reese Nelson, another, you know, youngster who I always sort of wanted to be successful at this club and showed glimpses of brilliance. Uh, again, loan moves just haven't worked out for him, has never had that run, of, run in the team to be consistent. So, yeah, I'm with you. Look, I wouldn't mind seeing any of these guys go. I think Nico Pepe, it's time. Hector Bayerin, you're right just doesn't suit the club anymore. What a wonderful servant to the club he's been and what a great yeah. character off the pitch. Lucas Torreira, you know, God, just what a nightmare uh, situation for both Immature. the club and him. Well, yeah, exactly. All the stuff that we've seen sort of recently. So no, uh, not surprised by any of these faces. And if we can get any money for them, then I'd be all for it. Um, focusing on pre-season so far, you mentioned the game, Clive. We have been pretty impressive. First of all, what does pre-season mean to you? You know, should we take any pride out of these results or is it fitness, sharpness, familiarity, combinations, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? Um, yeah, talk to me about your thoughts on pre-season first. And of course, you mentioned uh, Emirates Cup this Saturday, 12.30 at the Emirates against Sevilla, our final game before the start of the season. Yep, I, I shall be there. Um, so I, I, I love pre-season and I always go to the pre-season games. It's almost like, I'll give you an analogy here, right? You remember on election night when we select a new government, sometimes 
on that night when the politicians go for interviews, they're the most honest they actually are. You know, it's almost, it's almost like an insight. On that night, one night only, you get a bit of an honest view about what's really happening. I honestly feel with preseason, you can see things in a more relaxed way without the stress of the result. So you can see people's performance. You can see what they like to do, what they don't like doing, what they come back from preseason, from their holiday, sorry, and what comes naturally and what they have to work on. And you can learn about people if you're looking really closely. So I, I love preseason. I'll give you an example. So Ben White, and I like him. Not everybody does, but I like him. And I went to the um, Chelsea preseason game and last season, and I watched him closely. And I watched his feet. I watched his. I watched his presence. I looked at how he won the ball in the air, how he moved his feet very quickly across the ground to get up in the air quickly. And then he had his first game against Brentford, and everyone was saying he's rubbish. He's not going to make it. He got bullied. He got this. But I saw in preseason exactly what his abilities were against a top defense. He just had a bad day, right? So, and I could I could articulate that. And guess what? He settled in and he's been absolutely fine and uh, he won't be, but if he was our captain, I would be fine with it, right? So I think he's a really, really good footballer that's multi-positional and has got a really strong spirit and really wants to fight for this club. Another time in preseason, I learned something else. Remember last preseason, Granite Xhaka was off his off to Roma. It didn't quite happen. Yeah. And everyone was a little bit angry with him online. Went to the game. It might have been a Chelsea game again. And I'm thinking, oh, he's not going to be very popular. He warms up along the sideline and the crowd gave him a standing ovation. And I thought, you know what, mate? You learn things in preseason. The view you see online is not always the view you see in the stadium. And there is other people's thoughts that you have to bring into your own thinking. And sometimes you see this in preseason with a different crowd, different people, and a different view. When the stress as a result comes along, everything changes, right? So... I love preseason because it tells you about the atmosphere of the club, where we're going, the cohesion, the synergy, relationships in the club, how people are getting on. You see people move positionally, and you can ex- you see experiments. Do you see what I mean? And, and so to me, I, I gain a lot from it. Maybe because I'm a podcaster, <laughs> it helps me. But uh, in general, I take it for what it is. But I really do look at it closely and enjoy it. And to be fair. I mean, what a, what an opening 45 minutes we had against Chelsea. Now, I know Chelsea have got their problems and they're not going to be lining up the way they, they did against us. So they're going to have better players, more defenders, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But I was really impressed by how intense, uh, sorry, the intensity of our game, the way yeah. we were organised, that we were moving the ball around fast, the players looked sharp, quick, agile. I just thought, wow, yeah, I know it's only pre-season, but... but like you say, you you look for things, you look for signs, you, you take things away and think, right, do you know what, that we look really good. And if, yeah. you know, I, I suppose I want to say, Clive, that we look really prepared and I'm actually looking forward to going to Sellers Park next Friday. Yeah. Um, cue a 3 nil defeat, but <laughs> forget yeah. that. What what positives can you take out of this particular preseason? Well, being prepared day one is something that we haven't done for a while. When the, when the kids didn't get on the plane to go to the US, I'm thinking they're really focusing on preparation those training games they want adults in the room in those training games you know and so you're playing against each other at a higher level we haven't been prepared for a while and and i think and i've been one that says i sometimes dismiss those early games until the transfer window is is officially closed but this year with the early start to season the amount of games we have in august and september you can't do this and some of those games are very winnable if we that, I've never been more keyed up for a first game than I am this year. Because if we win it, we can get on a roll. We could really get on a roll and dictate us and really position ourselves for the season. So I think there's opportunity here. And, I, and I've got no issues. I think we're going to be fine at Palace game. Uh, and if they beat us, fair play to them, right? No, seriously, fair play to them. Because we're ready. No, we are ready. When that team sheet came out at Brentford last year, we all our hearts all sank. We had the COVID issues, we had the injuries, Saka back from the from the Euros, he was on the bench. We weren't ready. All our transfers weren't in the building. The same players that were playing that we didn't really want to play. We weren't ready until we played Norwich that first game in September. That's when we were ready. That's when the season started. You know, so being ready is important. The rest is down to us and our ability to execute. 
Um, but I feel more confident in our approach this preseason. Last preseason, I'm sure we, I'm not sure we won a game. I'm not sure we did. So this preseason, here we are, winning games, looking good, playing well, smiling. I'm liking it. I'm liking it. I like it too. Last couple of topics, but I can't not ask you about Edu. Obviously, yesterday or the day before, you did an interview with Sky Sports talking yeah. about the project, the transparency that you talked of, the examples of players and why he's not maybe signed them based on ego and profile and all that sort of stuff. But he also talked about winning and how, yeah. you know, he was asked, what do you think the objective of the club is? And he said, you know what, it's going to sound funny, but I want us to be winning winning things and getting back to the top. And of course, he's a former invincible. He understands the club. He knows yeah. what it takes to win. A, what did you make of the interview? And B, lead us into your expectations for next season, Clive. How would you define potential success and what would be a, a failure of a season, if I can be so binary? Yeah, that's right. it's okay. And I probably won't answer your question, but I'll answer one question. That normally I normally do answer the questions that I like. <laughs> so basically, <laughs> I think the interview was fantastic, right? But I'm, I'm, a, I'm a middle-aged man. I'm mature enough to listen to that and take it and take the information I'll give an example, right? So the Rafinha discussion that he had, he said, oh, I spoke to Deco and uh, I said, look, what, what's the score? And he sort of said, look, he wants to go to Barcelona, but he said, I'll, I'll keep us in touch. So what did that do to us as fans, right? I'll tell you what it did to us, right? So we see headlines saying, Barcelona first choice, Chelsea second choice, Arsenal third choice. We see a bid going in 50 million. Oh my goodness, what's going to happen to Saka? Let's do a video on him. Let's do a video on Rafinha. Let's do a scouting video. Let's do a video on where Saka could play. Is he going to play left wing? He's going to play left eight. He sent us all into an absolute frenzy. And I sort of, myself included, by the way. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> and and let's, let's get all the data out. Let's get all these threads out. So Adam will do a nice thread and Scott will do a nice thread. It, when it comes down to it, we love this. We absolutely love it. And we draw conclusions from it. And I thought the transparency Edu gave was really, really good. It was so matter of fact about what happens with your agent contacts. And sometimes you have to take this information and be mature enough to say, okay, what does this mean? It doesn't mean that we're scattergunning everywhere. It's just football. It's just, the, you know, just buying players. It's just, you need to do it with relationships. You need to make sure you're in the room. And we are now in the room. Towards the latter Venga area, we were not in the room with the right people. You don't forget, FK, I know you were there. We were <laughs> not in the room with the right people. Agents weren't talking to us. We were not on our game. You know, we were not on our game. Now we're on our game. Our talent ID is top. We've got people in the room talking to the right agents, to the right people who own the right players. And we've um, since raul has gone, I think that's improved significantly. Yeah. Massively. Right? So, um, so there's a change, right? So... So, yeah, I thought the Edu interview was fantastic. He, uh, he He's a Six Sigma guy to me, nice, lean guy. That's what he does. And I can see his project management strategy, and it's like, okay, let's see where we go, right? So he made sure that everyone knew the roles, responsibility, the accountabilities, the alignment, and decisions were shared. Yeah, I thought he was really, really good, really, really good. Do I answer anything uh, there? Did I, did I miss something? Kind of. I, I'm going to probe further by just talking yeah, about the, the comment that he made about winning. And, of course, okay. look, we know that we're, what, three years into a five-year project, and they talked about this project some time ago. The aim now must be to get back into the Champions League. But but next season for you, what are you expecting us to do? Like, If you're, if you're CEO, if you're Vinay, what are you saying, right, Mikel, this year you've got to get this? Well... Again, he said this. He's, again, he's, you can tell he's a corporate guy, right? So they said to him, do you want to be in the Champions League? And he straight away looked above that. And he goes to a mission statement. And he says, what I want to do is to invest in, in a team, paraphrasing here. I want to make sure that we're much better than last year. And if we're much better than last year, then the fact you asked me a question about it's in the top four, it's going to take care of itself. <laughs> you know, but it's true that and that's what you do. Your mission statement is above the actuals. If you do things appropriately, if you have a strategy and a plan that people can see and feel and pick up, you can sell it to people. You can sell that to Jesus. Do you think we're buying Jesus three years ago? Do you think we're buying him if Arteta didn't sign his contract? He's saying no, our manager is the most important person in the room. There's stability at the top table. That means we can attract the right level of people. Now, I will say this, and I, you people are thinking, yep, yeah, you took a bit of sense. I'm not sure why I'm quite with you. Whatever they're thinking, I'm telling you now, 
None of this is received positively if we haven't got a half-decent football team. A half-decent football team allows us to absorb these messages and take them in maturely. When you got a bad football team, what people do is say, you're talking rubbish, you're talking strategy, you're not talking actuals, because we've got Lich Steiner at right back. Do you see what I mean? And no matter what you're saying in the mahogany rooms of Arsenal, if you've got Lich Steiner at right back, you've got a problem. Do you see? And and I think you can't, again, you can't fall the punter. Get your team together and then talk. And then talk and to get more people and get more people on board. And, and I'm sensing that. I think they've been incredibly smart, incredibly engaging. But I'm ready for it in my stage of life, right? A younger fan may say, I don't care. I want this guy to go. I want this guy to go. Arteta, you got away at the end of last season. We had the top four, your Blue Palace, your Blue Southampton. And they're absolutely factually correct. You know, they're factually correct. You know, I could give context around it, but they're factually correct. And so I'm I'm, I'm at the oval and saying, we need to make sure that the plan is consistent and we keep doing it. And, and so far from where I am in my head and my, and my brain and how I look at football and project management and life and performance management, I, I like what I see. I like what I see. I love it, Clive. Well, look, a small but very important part of the jigsaw is going to be choice of captain selection. So I want to sort of push you on that because you you mentioned Ben White in conversation. Yeah. Martin Odegaard was obviously selected in our preseason friendly against Chelsea. Mikel Arteta had this to say about him. So again, just going to read it out. Odegaard was always listening, always helping his teammates. His attitude was absolutely phenomenal. That made me think that this guy is putting the team in front of himself and a captain has to do that always. He thinks about the team before himself. He had a period at the start where he wasn't playing. He was first in training, last to leave, asking the right questions, you know, why he wasn't playing and what he had to do. Did Erdegaard's selection at the weekend suggest to you that he's going to be club captain now for, for next year? And I guess just your overall thoughts on captain. Are you Is it quite a sacrosanct thing to you? Should it be, you know, five captains at a club? Just your general thoughts and, and give me a name. Yes, I thought, this is where I thought Emery was unfortunate, actually, with the five captains thing, the way that was managed in the press. I thought um, it, we made a big deal of it. Again, we haven't got a good football team. All your processes look poor, right? Liverpool have a leadership group. Everyone has a leadership group. They run the WhatsApp. They run the team meetings. They make sure people are there. They make sure the dinners are there. They make sure the wives are looked after. They come to the meals appropriately. There's a leadership group in every dressing room. It's never one person. Rob Holding is in our leadership group and is an outstanding individual, right? So, and, so and I question his football on occasion, but I don't question him as a, as a character, as an individual, right? So um, Lacazette is somebody who I question massively as a footballer, as an individual, a leader of young men. I know for a fact, and trust me, I know for a fact, he was the leader of that dressing room, right? So, and so there are two sides to this. So, and I've read what everyone else has read. Odegaard seems to be the prefect in the room the absolute golden boy, the coach on the pitch. If that's what the club thinks, that's what the dressing room thinks, because I think the dressing room picks the captain. That's what I think. That's the way it should be. It's not us, right? It should be the people inside. You know, I've been fortunate enough to go to London Colony on a, on a couple of occasions to watch training. And what I will say to everybody watching and listening, I promise you there's an, in, there's an inside family and there's an external world out there. And within the confines of London Colony, they are tight as a drum. They are a family and you need the right people in that family in the right roles. And if they decide, if they decide he is the captain, that is fine by me. And, and to be honest, he's a super pro, good footballer, international captain at 23. Um, he goes missing on occasions, but then again, we all have bad days, don't we? <laughs> he goes missing on occasions. Um, but we seem to backfill that with Fabio Vieira, right? So, again, we're learning lessons. So, yeah, I think he's a wonderful player. And when you see the game at the weekend, how good did he look, right? How good did he look? He looked tremendous. And, yeah, I agree with you. I think he's a fine selection for captain. And you're, and you're absolutely right about the environment and the inner the inner sort of circle, inner family, and, and the way that some of these men handled themselves. Clive, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, I said I wanted to be a, a short chat. I gave you the brief before the call, but I can't. I just I don't want to ever stop you. Talking I don't know how long you. we even spoke for, but well, I, I thought it's good. It's a good running time. People okay. seem to be happy, and there's almost 600 people watching live for this late oh, wow. 
afternoon coffee with Clive. Look, there we have it, guys. Uh, Clive is available on Twitter at Clive PAFC for anybody who's asleep. And of course, an amazing podcast that he's part of, the Arsenal Vision podcast. Uh, Clive, enjoy the season. Hopefully you'll be uh, kind enough to grace us again on this channel. I really appreciate it. For those of you guys who are watching, drop a like on the video, please. It's much appreciated. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. And until next time, look after yourselves and we'll see you soon. Thank you.